Chapter 12, Inflammation, a review from class from the Lewis textbook. The term inflammation is often but incorrectly used as a synonym for the term infection. Inflammation is always present with infection, but infection is not always present with inflammation. An infection involves invasion of tissues or cells by microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses. In contrast, inflammation can also be caused by heat, radiation, trauma, chemicals, allergens, and an autoimmune reaction. The mechanism of inflammation is basically the same regardless of how the person is injured. The intensity of the response depends on the extent and severity of injury and the reactive capacity of the injured person. So the sequential response to cell injury is that it neutralizes and dilutes the inflammatory agent, removes necrotic materials, and establishes an environment suitable for healing and repair. The inflammatory response can be divided into vascular response, cellular response, formation of exudate, and healing. After cell injury, the arterioles in the area briefly undergo a transient vasoconstriction. After the release of histamines by the injured cells, the vessels will dilate resulting in hyperemia. Chemical mediators then cause an increased capillary permeability and facilitate fluid movement from the capillaries into the tissue spaces. So the fluid in the tissue spaces initially is composed of serous fluid. Later, it would contain plasma proteins and primarily albumin. The proteins exert oncotic pressure that further draws that fluid from the blood vessels, and that's why the tissue becomes edematous. Both vasodilation and increased capillary permeability are responsible for redness, heat, and swelling at the site of injury. As plasma protein fibrinogen leaves the blood, it is activated to fibrin by products of the injured cell. Fibrin strengthens a blood clot formed by the platelets. In the tissue, the clots trap bacteria to prevent the spread. Blood flow through the capillaries in the area of the inflammation slows as fluid is lost and viscosity increases. Neutrophils and monocytes move to the inner surface of the capillaries and then migrate through the capillary wall to the site of the injury. Chemotaxis is a directional migration of white blood cells along a concentration gradient of chemotactic factors. It's a mechanism for accumulating neutrophils and monocytes at the site of injury. The neutrophils are the first leukocytes to arrive at the site of the injury like about 6 to 12 hours. They phagocytize bacteria and other foreign material and damage cells. They have a short lifespan of 24 to 48 hours. Now the pus is composed of dead neutrophils accumulated at the site of injury, digested bacteria, and any other cell debris. Sometimes the demand for neutrophils increases to the extent that the bone marrow releases immature forms of neutrophils, also known as bands, and it's released into the circulation. The finding of increased number of band neutrophils in the circulation is called a shift to the left, which is commonly found in patients with acute bacterial infection. So if a wound looks infected, get a wound culture. Now monocytes are the second type of phagocytic cells to migrate to the site of injury from circulating blood. They're attracted to the site by chemotactic factors and arrive within three to seven days after the onset of inflammation. When monocytes enter tissue spaces, they transform into macrophages. They assist in phagocytosis of inflammatory debris and macrophages have a long lifespan and can multiply. A macrophage is important in cleaning the area before healing can occur, and it could stay in damaged tissue for weeks. The cells may fuse to form a multinucleated giant cell, and the giant cell is then encapsulated by collagen, leading to the formation of a granuloma. A classic example of this process occurs with the tubercule bacillus in the lung. Lymphocytes arrive later at the site of injury. The primary roles of lymphocytes involve cell-mediated immunity and humoral immunity. Histamine is stored in granules of basophils, mast cells, and platelets and cause vasodilation and increased capillary permeability. Serotonin is stored in platelets, mast cells, and enterochromaffin cells of the GI tract and cause the same action as histamine as well as stimulating smooth muscle contractions. Kinins, like bradykinin, are produced from precursor factor kinogen as a result of activation of the Hagemann factor 12 
of the clotting system and cause contraction of smooth muscle and vasodilation. This results in the stimulation of pain. Major functions of the complement system are enhanced phagocytosis, increased vascular permeability, chemotaxis, and cellular lysis. The complement system is a major mediator of the inflammatory response. In autoimmune disorders, healthy tissue can be damaged by complement activation and the resulting inflammatory response. An example is rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus. Following injury, arachidonic acid is converted into prostaglandins, thromboxane, and leukotrienes. It is considered pro-inflammatory. These are potent vasodilators. And some subtypes of prostaglandins are formed when platelets are activated and can inhibit platelet and neutrophil aggregation. Prostaglandins also perform a significant role in sensitizing pain receptors to arousal by stimuli that would normally be painless. Prostaglandins also have a role as pyrogens when stimulating the temperature regulating area of the hypothalamus and producing a febrile response. Corticosteroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and acetylsalicylic acid act to inhibit various steps in this pathway. Thromboxane is a powerful vasoconstrictor. It is platelet aggregating agent and promotes clot formation. It has a short half-life and the pallor soon gives way to the vasodilating effects of prostaglandin and histamine. Leukotrienes are known as slow-reacting substance of anaphylaxis, which constricts smooth muscles of bronchi, causing narrowing of the airway, and increases capillary permeability, leading to airway edema. Exudate consists of fluid and leukocytes that move from the circulation to the site of injury. Nature and quantity depend on the type and severity of the injury and the tissues involved. The local response to inflammation is redness, heat, pain, swelling, and loss of function. Systemic response to inflammation is an increased white blood cell count with a shift to the left. Patient would experience malaise, nausea, and anorexia, increased pulse and respiratory rate, and fever. Leukocytosis results from the increased release of white blood cells from the bone marrow. And the systemic response to inflammation is poorly understood, but it is probably due to a complement activation and the release of cytokines. Some of the cytokines are IL-1, IL-6, and tumor necrosis factor. Although relatively rare, drug therapy may cause an acquired neutropenia in some people. The drugs most likely to be associated with moderate neutropenia are chemotherapy and immunosuppressive drugs, antithyroid medications, antibiotics, anti-rheumatics, antipsychotics, and anticonvulsants. Systemic response to inflammation, we start with fever. The onset is triggered by release of cytokines, and the cytokines cause fever by initiating metabolic changes in the temperature regulating center in the hypothalamus. Epinephrine is released from the adrenal medulla, increases metabolic rate. The synthesis of the prostaglandins is the most critical metabolic change, as they act directly to increase the thermostatic set point. The hypothalamus then activates the autonomic nervous system to stimulate increased muscle tone and shivering and decreased perspiration and blood flow to the periphery. Patients then would experience chills and shivering. The body is hot, yet the person seeks warmth until the circulating temperature reaches the core body temperature. Acute inflammation healing would occur in two to three weeks usually leaving no residual damage. Neutrophils are the predominant cell type at the site of inflammation. Subacute has some features as acute inflammation but persists longer. For example, infective endocarditis is an infection with an acute inflammation but it persists for weeks or months. Chronic could last for years. The predominant cell types involved are lymphocytes and macrophages and this may result from changes in the immune system, such as an autoimmune disease. Examples of chronic inflammation include rheumatoid arthritis and osteomyelitis. Nursing and collaborative management. The ability to recognize a clinical manifestation of inflammation is important. In the individual who is immunosuppressed, taking corticosteroids or receiving chemotherapy, the classic symptoms of inflammation may be masked, and early symptoms of inflammation may be just malaise, or not feeling well. Vital signs are important to note with any inflammation, especially when an infectious process is present. When infection is present, the temperature may rise and the pulse and respiratory rate may increase. B 
because mild to moderate fever usually does little harm and imposes no great discomfort and may benefit the host defense mechanisms, antipyretic drugs are rarely essential to patient welfare. Moderate fevers are up to 103 degrees Fahrenheit and it usually produces few problems in most patients. However, if the patient is very young or very old, is extremely uncomfortable or has significant medical problems like severe cardiopulmonary disease or a brain injury, the use of antipyretics should be considered. Fever, especially if greater than 104 degrees Fahrenheit, can be damaging to body cells and delirium and seizures can occur. Fever, especially if greater than 104 degrees, can be damaging to body cells and delirium and seizures can occur. At temperatures greater than 105.8, Regulation by the Hypothalamic Temperature Control Center becomes impaired, and damage can occur to many cells, including those in the brain. The nursing implementation should be health promotion, prevention of injury, adequate nutrition, early recognition of inflammation, and immediate treatment. The best management of inflammation is the prevention of infection, trauma, surgery, and contact with potentially harmful agents. Because this isn't always possible, Concerted efforts to minimize inflammation and infection are needed. Adequate nutrition is essential so that the body has the necessary factors to promote healing when injury occurs. This includes high fluid intake and additional calories. Persons should be taught early recognition of clinical symptoms as well as the importance of immediate treatment to prevent extension and complications of inflammation. Drugs are used to decrease the inflammatory response and lower the body temperature. Aspirin blocks prostaglandin synthesis in the hypothalamus and elsewhere in the body. Acetaminophen acts on the heat regulating center in the hypothalamus. Some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen have antipyretic effects. Corticosteroids are antipyretics through the dual mechanisms of preventing both cytokine production and prostaglandin synthesis. Antipyretics should be given round the clock to prevent acute swings in temperature which then can produce chills. So nursing and collaborative management is rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And this is a key concept in treating any of the soft tissue injuries and related inflammation. Rest helps the body to use nutrients and oxygen for the healing process. Cold application is usually appropriate at the time of the initial trauma to promote vasoconstriction and decrease swelling, pain, and congestion from increased metabolism in the area of inflammation. Heat may be used later, like after 24 to 48 hours, to promote healing by increasing the circulation to the inflamed site and subsequent removal of debris. Compression can serve to counter the vasodilation effects and development of edema. And elevating the injured extremity above the level of the heart will reduce the edema at the inflammatory site by increasing venous and lymphatic return and also help reduce pain associated with blood engorgement at the injury site. The final phase of the inflammation process is healing, and healing includes two major components, regeneration and repair. Regeneration is the replacement of lost cells and tissues with the cells of the same type. The ability of cells to regenerate depends on the type of the cell. Repair is healing as a result of lost cells being replaced by connective tissue. Repair is more common type of healing and usually results in scar formation.